In this episode, I'm going to interview Garvin Jabush uh, from the Green Alpha Advisors firm. They have an interesting investment strategy based on the next economy. This is the Impact Financial Planners Podcast with Bill Holiday, making sustainable, responsible impact investing easy for socially conscious investors who want to make a positive change in society through their investments. This is brought to you by AIO Financial, a fee-only fiduciary financial planning firm specializing in sustainable, responsible impact ESG investing at AIOfinancial.com. All right, thank you for joining me on this episode. I'm really glad to have Garvin here for an interview with Garvin here on this episode. He is the Chief Investment Officer for Green Alpha Advisors. He co-founded Green Alpha in 2007. He leads the investment research, conducts macroeconomic, scientific, and technological analysis, and develops communication. It develops and communicates the next economy investment approach. Uh, he spoke at a recent conference that I attended about socially responsible investing. He has quite a, a long background in investing. I'll just hit a couple highlights. He previously worked for Forward Management, where he managed the Sierra Club Stock Fund and Sierra Club Equity Income Fund. He was Vice President of Strategic Services at Morgan Stanley. He was a whitewater rafting guide, has an MBA. You can check out his bio on his site for more details. But he, he knows what he's doing. Um, he's also a physical anthropologist and archaeologist. So, uh, yeah, he's got a diverse background. All right, let's go to the interview. Garvin, thanks a lot for joining me. Yeah, thanks, Bill. I guess let's start. I just wanted a little introduction to Green Alpha. You know, just what do you offer and maybe even a little history? Sure. And uh, if I go on a little long, just just cut me off. <laughs> I mean, you really open a can of worms when you ask about history. No, not, not really. Uh, you know, we're an asset manager, as you know, um, and we offer several different strategies, uh, all long only public equities. Uh, and they are all based on the same thesis. Uh, we call our thesis Next Economics, and we call it Practical Application Next Economy Portfolio Theory. And the idea there is, and here I'll, I'll give the little bit of history, is that we perceived, uh, my co-founder, Jeremy Deems and I, uh, a few years back, we perceived that uh, the way that sustainability-focused equity investing uh, was only uh, addressing about half the picture. It was at that time, and by, by at that time, I mean, you know, in 2007, uh, it was really still very much focused on negative screening. And the problem with that was, is that while it does uh, get rid of whatever companies a client finds objectionable, it still uh, leaves you with whatever is left in, say, whatever benchmark index that you're attempting uh, to track, it, it leaves you with whatever is left in there. Uh, it's very much a process of starting with your index that you hope to to track or have low tracking error with and uh, take out what you don't like and then just invest in what's left. And we thought, well, the reason that exists is because, you know, Bill, as you know very well, in our industry, modern portfolio theory rules the day. And what that says is, or at least as folks practice it nowadays, I'm not sure Markowitz would agree, but what that says is that uh, low tracking error with the index is the gold standard of measuring risk. And whatever your benchmark is, make sure you track it pretty well. Beat it by a little, but track it pretty well. And we realized that what that is doing is limiting our exposure to what's next in sustainability. It's at once preventing us from really investing in what's next. And on the other hand, it's keeping us exposed to a lot of stuff in the legacy economy, even if we're doing negative screening. So for next economy portfolio theory, we thought, you know, what if we approach the whole thing a little bit more like a venture capitalist would, even though we're in the public equity space, meaning let's look for things that are solving an unmet need that are going to be solving for a big systemic risk that are doing so in a way that is more competitive than its legacy economy predecessor or counterpart. And that can be done to the, to the benefit of its owners, meaning the shareholders. 
So really going after what's smart, what is increasing productivity, what's going to work best, and what's going to solve our big problems. Can, can I just, when you're saying it's, it's a little difficult in the ESG, SRI world to track an index, yeah. you're just saying that if the index is the S&P 500 and it has at 11% in energy, then by eliminating fossil fuels, we're way underexposed so that we load up on something else to fill that gap? I mean, is that kind of a problem? Yeah. That, that's a, yeah, Bill, that's exactly, that's exactly the problem we, we thought we were confronting. Uh, you know, put another way, sometimes I like to say that the, uh, what I think of as the old-fashioned way of doing uh, SRI or ESG investing was grabbing an index and then trying to Frankenstein it into something more green, as opposed right. to starting with a blank sheet and building up a portfolio of what the sustainable economy looks like. And so your portfolios, I mean, how do they, are they overweighted in different, I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't even know, energy yeah. or transportation or how do they compare? It's just yeah. way different? Um, not as different as you might think. We actually managed to find really great diversification, even within companies that are not causing systemic risk and that are seeking solutions to those risks. There are a lot of companies out there doing some amazing stuff. And you know, we have an index of 120 companies that is relatively well diversified. But that said, you're right. You know, our active share versus S&P 500 is 97%. You know, we don't overlap much, much with it at all. And we don't attempt to. Uh, part of that is we don't believe you can correlate with the legacy economy and still have appropriate portfolio exposure to what's coming next. I, I can imagine so, your companies or your portfolio would have a lot more small caps too than an S&P because you're, you're getting... Yeah companies that are trying to put something new out there. Yeah, Bill, we, um, you know, Morningstar calls us mid cap, but the truth is we're all cap. Uh, we do go right down into the micros and right up into some of the big guys. So not having an all cap category, Morningstar just kind of throws up its hands and says, well, okay, you're mid cap. Sure. Uh, but you're right. We do. We have some smalls. We have quite a few mids and we do have some larges and even a couple of megas. Uh, and, and to get back to your previous question, we find that we do have more weight than most major benchmark indices uh, in tech. We definitely have more in renewable energies. Uh, energy overall, we find that we're uh, either kind of in there with the uh, indices or maybe a little bit more. Uh, we do think that renewable, renewable energies, if you're careful and have a, and have a value-based approach, and, and therefore pick what I would think of as the right ones in, in that area, uh, do have a long, bright future ahead of them as solar goes from, you know, for example, wind too, but as solar goes from, you know, 1% of the global energy mix to 50% over the next 30 years, obviously there's a ton of greenfield and growth uh, ahead of that industry. Again, if you're smart with your picks, you can't just indiscriminately buy solar right now because it's a little bit of a maze. Sure. But as long as you're careful, I think there's just fantastic opportunity there. So we do tend to have more weight in some areas than others. And then the other tricky thing with that is, how do you measure what industry you're even in? You know, S&P 500 uses GICs, the, the Global Industry Classification System. Well, according to GICs, you, you don't even have energy exposure if you're not burning something to make the energy. So our solar and wind exposure, according to GICs, looks like a technology. Oh. Well, that's fine, but it doesn't look very good on the pie chart. It makes us look way overweight on technology and way underweight on energy. Sure. So we, uh, we find that we like the Bloomberg industry classification scheme better, and that's what we use on our fact sheets and such because they do make that differentiation. They're uh, maybe a little bit more forward-looking than the old-school Gix is. So it's interesting. By, by what yardstick are, are you even measuring those things? And so I saw you have five or six different offerings. Yeah. And are those, they're looked like one mutual fund in five separate account strategies. Are they similar strategies? And actually, how do you even access them? I didn't see where are they held or where can they be purchased? Sure. So uh, I'll take those in reverse order just because that's what comes to mind. Uh, the mutual fund, of course, uh, NEXTX, uh, can be purchased on any brokerage platform uh, or via your advisor or uh, anywhere you can buy, uh, can buy a normal 40 act fund. Right. Uh, Hold it Schwab or Fidelity or Vanguard or just wherever. Just wherever. 
Yep. Uh, our separate strategies are on uh, about, about, I believe, 17 different platforms now uh, and accessible uh, there. So uh, uh, we like the ones where we can uh, set up models and manage the weight. So we, we love when folks want to access our models on uh, Folio Institutional, uh, but we're also, they're also available at Morgan Stanley. They're also at Schwab. Uh, and we can we can open up separate account client accounts on lots of different platforms. Uh, the the best thing to do to to find out if we're available on your platform is just drop us an email and, and we'll work with you. I didn't realize. So I know Folio. You're kind of this overlay. Yeah. And, and it does this filter, and so the the account ends up being all the individual stocks. That's right. Is that Schwab does the same thing? No, in Schwab we hack we have to trade the accounts individually in the case of a separate account. So you just open a separate account and then it's under your management there. Yep, and then we, yeah. we uh, trade it to mirror uh, our model, which would then look like the same model you would get on Folio, uh, sure. but more manually traded by our OMS as opposed to just uh, Folio doing it in an automated way. Gotcha. So okay. that, that's one reason we, we try to point for folks to Folio instead of one of the other platforms uh, and unless they are particularly wedded to the platform where they, where they already are with their other uh, accounts. So if they're already a Schwab person, well, then that's, that's understandable and we're happy to work with someone on Schwab. Uh, but if they are agnostic to platform, we prefer to, to point them towards Folio because, because it's automated, we're able to uh, get their overall feed down a little bit. Oh, because of the trading costs, the Folio does it differently. Yep. Okay. And, and Folio also just has lower custody fees than most of the big banks. Gotcha. Oh, that's good to know. That, that, I'm kind of new this year to the Folio system. I hadn't heard of that before where you just overlay and have the stocks. It's, it's pretty slick. I mean, it's it is. Setup. It is. You know, so every time we change one of our models in, in one of our five separate account strategies, uh, we simply upload that update to Folio and it takes care of all the accounts uh, that where we are listed as the manager underneath. So it's really very slick and convenient and we can do it, therefore, for a relatively low cost. Gotcha. And then your portfolios, are those, do they vary much? I mean, they're all new economy, so I'd imagine there's quite a bit of overlap. Yeah, you know, they all do uh, flow from the same thesis. Everything's next economics, right? Which means never buy the causes of a systemic risk always buy the solutions to the systemic risks. Sure. So we, we've always been fossil free. Uh, we've always just looked for the things that are driving uh, productivity gains and innovation and uh, renewable energies, of course. We love waste to value. And then increasingly we think about uh, inequality as a systemic risk. So we're trying to make investments that address that as well. And so, yeah, every strategy we manage does flow from that same philosophy. And the way that they differ is what they're designed to do in terms of their long-term uh, goals of the account holder. So uh, our growth and income portfolio, we right now we, we have it yielding a, a little over 5% dividend yield. And so that's for people looking for a little bit of income or who maybe aren't as excited by the volatility and our other strategies. Uh, the one that we have co-branded with the Sierra Club, Sierra Club Green Alpha, predictably right. named, <laughs> um, is our most concentrated and therefore the most volatile. And it has been known to you know have a 100% year uh, which it did in 2013, I believe, or, you know, or have a meaningfully negative year. Overall, its average annuals are good, but the volatility around that center, uh, you know, is a lot. Sure, sure. Uh, and then uh, probably our most popular uh, separate account is our Green Alpha Next Economy Index. We call it GANX for short. And that has every stock in it that we deem to live in the next economy and also uh, pass our bottom up process and therefore be deemed by us to be investment worthy. So that's basically the whole, that's, that's our attempt to get our arms around the whole next economy, right? If you yeah. like, that's our S and P 500 for the future. And I saw that a lot of them have maybe 20% foreign too. So you do try to get global. We sure do. And, uh, in the, in the next economy index, uh, we're more like 35% foreign by weight. And by source of revenues, it's over half. Okay. And, we think, and we think that's important. Uh, you know, there's a few reasons for that. There's the normal reasons, just geographical diversification is good for risk management. But sure. also when you're talking about next economy names, you know, you mentioned renewable energy. 
Well, there are some places that are still a little bit uh, intransigent when it comes to that. You know, we have tariffs on solar in this country. So it's really nice that some of my solar manufacturers uh, have most of their distribution in Southeast Asia. They, you know, they're not confronted with that and they're still making plenty of money. Yeah. So that's kind of, that's part of what I meant when I mentioned earlier that uh, renewables are tricky right now and you've really got to do your homework to pick the ones that have the best shot at being the winners. Yeah, some of these I could see being a longer play. I mean, eventually, you know, we're getting off of fossil fuels, but it could be a long, depending on administrations and yeah. government policies, it could be whatever, not a straight line. Yeah, that's right. You know, when, when I mentioned that it looks like solar is poised uh, globally to have, you know, a 25x uh, growth in its deployments uh, over the next couple of uh, of decades, uh, you know, I don't think any serious uh, economist or thinker disputes that. But you're right, it's not going to be a straight line, it's going to be uneven, it's going to be lumpy, it's going to be tricky. So you definitely want to benefit from that growth, but you really have to have your eye right on it all the time yeah. to, uh, to really get the benefit from it. And, and then th the other side is equally true, you know, fossil fuels will be phased out and at least greatly diminished over the next couple, three decades, but that also won't be a straight line. You know, right. sometimes people ask me, hey, why don't you have a long short strategy and get short the causes of our big risks, right? So fossil fuels and internal combustion <laughs> yeah. engines and, you know, glyphosate. Get a little bit more makers. volatility in there. Oh, <laughs> uh, that just scares me. Like, I, I do think that over the long run, a fossil short would be a great idea, but am I gonna have to pay a big mark to market tomorrow? Yeah, maybe, and I don't yeah. want to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you don't know that. That right? I could see avoiding that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, d does Green Alpha? Do you guys engage with shareholder advocacy or voting proxies? That kind of engagement. We're, yeah. Well, we're really aggressive on voting proxies. Uh, Arena Abbott, who is our boss of marketing, uh, also takes care of that, and she very carefully reviews every proxy. And then, in our investment committee meetings uh, weekly, we review all the ones that she has any questions on. You know, we've got a long manual that is full of uh, everything we want to vote on uh, and or against. So, sure. you know, we always vote uh, for more diversity on boards. We always vote to change the auditor. We always are careful with executive comp, all, all of those issues. On the other side, though, in terms of reaching out and, and actively engaging, uh, while we have done a little bit of that, we're not as aggressive there as some ESG managers uh, because we simply don't own the causes of the big problems. So we're not going to oh, right. uh, take the approach of buying, you know, say Exxon and then pressuring them to put a climate scientist on the board. Uh, other managers have taken that approach and that's absolutely valid. I think we need to, uh, we need to address our, our, our uh, big risks on all fronts, but that's just not our approach. I, I'd just rather not hold that to start with and, and therefore there, I don't have anything to engage with. Right. Now, uh, sometimes inside, of solutions providers, we will see something that we think is worth engaging on, but it's just not uh, as common. That, that makes sense. And how about you do do fixed, uh, fixed investments? I mean, do you do community investing or, I mean, what kind of fixed investments do you get into? You know, we're just, we've just gotten started in that in the last couple of years uh, and neither uh, me, uh, nor my co-founder, Jeremy Deans, and, uh, nor the other uh, member of our investment committee, our chief operating officer, uh, Betsy Mosetter, uh, none of us uh, have experience uh, in fixed income. So for that, we have engaged a third party, Charles Sandmill, whom you might know. He's, uh, he's been a green bond guy for years, and he really knows what he's doing. So he helps us select those. And no, we're mostly corporates, and some governments, especially when they are uh, project bonds, where they're pointed uh, specifically at a, at a municipality, say, that's working on a, on a, well, I guess that could be community solar, but not so much a community bond, more uh, municipal. And, yeah. uh, and then also uh, green bonds from corporate America. But even there, they need to be uh, within what we would think of as the next economy. Yeah, so, I mean, I guess yeah. community investing, I, I, that's kind of a vague topic, but, but supporting or green bonds or supporting your screening on your fixed income for causes yeah. that, that fit your thesis or fit your mission. Yeah, it, it, exactly. And so our role in that is to let Charles know, uh, you know, here are all the corporate actors, you know, if you like, here's the list of the Ganex companies, 
that we think belong in the next economy and we therefore would be pleased owning their debt. And then his role is then to go out being the bond expert, which again, we're not, uh, is to go out and, and find debt instruments uh, that those companies uh, issue that we can then put our uh, fixed income uh, interested clients into. Uh, and he also looks for uh, green bond funds that uh, we can aggregate into, if you like, sort of a portfolio of funds. Sure. So yeah, that all makes- that's, yeah. What about, could you just touch on some of the other areas? I know energy makes a lot of sense. We know where it's going. Here, here's where we are. Here's future. Yeah. What other, you know, to get a diversified portfolio, what other industries or areas are you looking at? You know, everywhere there's an innovative disruption that is uh, either in, in greatly, hopefully, improving the productivity of the economy uh, or directly solving a risk in a way that, dis- again, disrupts its predecessor, uh, we're interested in. So uh, starting with agriculture, uh, we're interested in things that support indoor farming. Uh, as, you know, the Green Revolution uh, allowed us to escape Malthus's curse and, and the Club of Rome said we were going to run out of uh, ability to feed ourselves with, with world farming, you know, as early as the mid-70s. And, of course, we avoided that with herbicides, pesticides, and, of course, fertilizers. Uh, but now that's run its course. And, you know, uh, the UN is saying there might be 50 harvests left in the topsoil of most of the world. So we think, well, what's a solution? And increasingly, it, it, folks are turning around the world are turning to indoor farming. This is a huge benefit, right? Because it's close to, can be close to urban centers. It uses maybe 1% of the water of outdoor farming. So it's hyper water efficient on that level. It's naturally organic because it's indoors. You don't need herbicides or pesticides. Uh, but it's energy intensive. So where are the investment plays there? Well, companies that make grow grow lights are obviously key. Uh, The companies that actually provide the infrastructure, the repurposing of the like shipping containers to do that. And then of course, they all need to be covered with solar panels and have access to wind energy as well. So there's an interesting nexus there. And there's companies that make the more crop for drop uh, indoor irrigation systems that make interesting verticals. Um, And then, you know, where else around the economy? I, uh, I always like to mention that even though he's a biologist, in my mind, uh, E.O. Wilson, the, the Harvard biologist and the uh, founder of the Half Earth Movement, is actually an economist because he will talk a lot about how the, the uh, digitization of the economy, the digitalization of the economy is making it more productive and more efficient. Well, in, in economic terms, what he's saying is our technology and innovation is proceeding to the point where we're getting a lot more economic impact outputs out of far fewer economic inputs. Wilson's comment there is that we're going to be able to ultimately uh, take into to its ultimate conclusion of that process, get so much output out of so few input that we can all derive a good standard of living without crossing the planetary boundaries, just far, far more and more productive. So we're interested in that, right? So we love things like automation, like AI, like machine learning, like the internet of things, connectivity in general, uh, the backbone of smart cities. We think these things are, while they don't appear to be sustainability oriented, perhaps at first glance, they are actually deeply important in terms of getting the world onto a sustainable footing in the long run. And we think that that's critical. And not only that, but because it's associated with such great productivity gains, it also means it creates wealth and makes a fantastic long-term investment. So it is a win-win. Yeah. Well, back to um, agriculture, like these greenhouse or, or indoor. So are they good investments at this time? I mean, I, I could see that being the future um, after the 50 harvests or after, <laughs> you know, it, it becomes a cost. But I, I could see it just costing more at this point. Yeah. Yeah. And so you start slow and yeah, okay. you have relatively minimal exposure for now. And you get your exposure in markets that have lots of other applications still too. So, you know, I mentioned agricultural lights. Uh, That makes a fantastic investment right now because in addition to the long-term agricultural need, uh, you immediately have lots of market for that. So from indoor grow operations here in Colorado for obvious reasons to, uh, to uh, just uh, uh, indoor gardeners who just love their plants and who want to buy grow lights. Like there's actually a huge demand for those already. 
And Philips Lighting, just to tip my hand on a holding, <laughs> is a great example of somebody providing those who has an established existing market, is making great revenues doing that, and stands to benefit as indoor farming grows. Yeah. So it, it's sort of a now and then play. I, I get you. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you definitely have to be looking at what's a good buy today or what's yeah. uh, a good value for the investment, but knowing that in the future, that's where we could be moving. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What's working already now and yet poised to benefit from the mega trend. Sure. How has not being in fossil fuels, are there any other sectors where you're not in that? I mean, have you had any performance issues? I can't really say that we have. Uh, I will say that we perform differently than the big benchmarks. So you'll have a hard time finding a, a strong correlation between any of our strategies and, and any kind of a major benchmark or, or uh, index. Um, we have general equities correlation, of course. So of the, of the major indices, the one we probably correlate the most with is the MSCI Acqui, the all world, uh, just because that's every investable stock, they say. And so... <laughs> you have general equities correlation there. And that's probably as close as we come. Um, overall, our average annuals, uh, particularly on the GANX, which is gonna have 10 years of track record on December 30th, its average annual is competitive with most of the big global indices. It outperforms some years, underperforms other years, or months or days for that matter. <laughs> but uh, no, in aggregate, we can't perceive that we've had performance issues. And in general, we're very pleased with the long-term performance. Yeah, that, I mean, that's what the conference seemed to point to that, that there was no fault or, or bad part of avoiding some sector. You're not performing. I, we don't perceive any. And, you know, we have, uh, we're not talking about a backtest or a hypothetical either. We're talking about 10 years of live money track record. That's very easy to audit and, and see for yourself. Yeah, that's great. Do you have plans in the future for any, I mean, I think the mutual fund is the most attractive for my clients just because it's the accessibility of it. Yeah. But I do I, think that folio strategy may become more and more popular. We'll it's, see. I can tell you from, from our point of view, it is. We, we're getting more and more interested in that, uh, mostly from advisors. Uh, but also just from individuals uh, as well, if they, if they uh, reach our separate account minimum, which we actually keep pretty low it, it, relative to the world of separate accounts. Uh, you what know, is, I saw, I mean, the Sierra Club minimum is, what, 10,000? It's, it's only 10,000. Yeah. And the Sierra Club, uh, in order to, uh, for, to reach the agreement for the co-branding, uh, really wanted it to be that low because they want their separate account strategy to be accessible to most of their members. That's it's great. not just for Sierra Club members, uh, but that's who they intend it for, sure. right? So that's why that's so low. And then outside of that, our minimums uh, are in a couple of our strategies, 100,000. And in a couple of the tougher to, to run ones, uh, they're 250. But as you know very well, in separate account land, that's super low. That's v relatively low, yeah. And, and we do want to keep them low. We want to democratize access to what we think of as actual sustainability-focused investing. You know, I, I don't know if you heard Jeremy Grantham's uh, speech at uh, the yeah. SRI conference. He's obviously fantastic, and he's got his eye right on the right risks, in my opinion, and he's thinking about it right. And their climate change portfolio is very interesting. It isn't that different from what we've been doing for 10 years, although he's got a little more exposure to like commodities like copper, because he perceives probably correctly that we're going to need a ton of that conducting metal to have things like more electric vehicles. Okay. Uh, I don't disagree with that. Uh, the big difference is you need to be extremely high net worth to access his strategies. You need to come with five or 10 million, you yeah. know? So relative to that, I, I think a hundred thousand looks like a pretty uh, accessible deal. Right. I agree. <laughs> yeah. That's super. Um, okay. I, I appreciate your time. This is great information. Uh, I really like the approach you're taking that, that I, I haven't heard of many firms talking this way about really making that the, the fundamental mission of their investments. Yeah. You know, I, I think that most managers, you know, you got a, you got a, you did a CFA, you got an MBA and you think that you, uh, there's a requirement to subscribe to modern portfolio theory. But the truth is there isn't. There is because we think there is. But I think it's entirely possible to think a little bit more like a venture capitalist and just go right after what's going to work and not worry about whether or not you correlate. Right, right. And, and you know, things like ESG scores kind of as valuable as they are tend to muddy that picture, in my opinion. 
uh, because if you fall into the trap that if a company has good ESG scores, it belongs in a sustainability portfolio, uh, you, uh, in our opinion, you, you've missed the boat because what matters most is what a company does, where it's getting paid, how it earns its revenue. And if it's not earning its revenue from providing a solution, then it doesn't belong in the next economy. Or put another way, if a company isn't doing something to lower the risk profile of the economy and the environment that supports the economy, then the tailwinds aren't going to be there for that company indefinitely. Well, the, the ESG scores, I think, uh, can be very misleading because they're best of class kind yeah. of setups. I mean, I think it's useful. I'm glad they're starting to have some kind of criteria or, or way to measure, but uh, yeah, people need to look carefully before trusting that. Yeah. You, you know, a fossil fuels company could have a fantastic ESG right. score. You right. know, I know a lot of internal Weapons combustion company. engine makers. Yeah. You know, we won't buy internal combustion because that's a major, uh, not only emitter of, of greenhouse gases and all kinds of noxious pollution that is really bad for us, but it's also the major demand driver for fossil fuels. Like you can't own Toyota. They, right. they make 10 million cars uh, uh, a year and the average fleet MPG is 26. They, you know, they're probably Exxon's favorite firm because they drive half their demand. Like that's a cause of a risk. So I don't really care how good its ESG score is. Right, right. So yeah, our approach is definitely a little different, but, but hopefully that differentiates us. Yeah, definitely. No, I, I like the di direction you're going and that's, that's great that you're out there. Um, and it's, it's nice that it's accessible. That's, that's really helpful. Cool. And you know, the other thing we're hoping to do to go kind of way back and answer your question is uh, in the relatively near future, by which I, I hope I mean 2019, is get an ETF out as well. Oh, great. And that'll help the accessibility even more. Definitely. No, that, that's great. That's a goal. All right, Garvin, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Bill, I really uh, had a great time. Thanks for having me. I hope that was helpful. This is a pretty unique investment approach. Just as a disclosure, this podcast is for informational use only. We're not making investment recommendations. This is not an appropriate investment or these are not appropriate for everyone. As with any investment, please read the prospectus, discuss it with your financial planner. All right. Thank you for listening to the Impact Financial Planners podcast. We have several uh, other podcasts coming up, a few more interviews scheduled. We have several coming up. Every couple of weeks, I'll be posting. This has been brought to you by AIO Financial. If you need help with any part of your finances, please contact AIO Financial for a free meeting, AIOfinancial.com. As always, I appreciate your feedback. I love comments in the, on the YouTube videos, on the podcast. Comments are great. You can also email me or send me a Twitter connection or Facebook, whatever works for you. My email address is bill at aiofinancial.com. I will respond to any comments I get. Uh, all right. And if you like these podcasts and videos, please leave a brief review and rating on iTunes or Stitcher or, G or Google Play or at YouTube. Please subscribe to the channel, post a comment. It will make it easier for other people to find this, to move this work forward. All right. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye.